So, Splatoon 2 went and got itself some paid DLC. This is on top of all the free online DLC the game has been getting for over the past year, which we'll be talking about as well. Now, if you don't remember or didn't play it, the first Splatoon had a good single player, but it wasn't anything outstanding. Splatoon 2, on the other hand, had an okay single player, but it's not that great and pretty anticlimactic. With the DLC being single player, the big question was, can we get it right this time around? Can they have a strong single player in a multiplayer focused game? This game plays just like the default game single player. Nothing really new has been added. However, the actual mechanics and how the actual levels work this time around is different. The default game had 32 moderately sized mission. The expansion on the other hand has 80 missions, which is a lot, but they're also not very long. Now them being short may seem like a bad thing, but because of their length and the difficulty, no single gimmick ever overstays its welcome. When you do see a gimmick multiple times though, there's usually some new twist on it making it fresh, pun intended, and sometimes more difficult. In the default game, you had about 8 weapons and 3 subs to choose from. Each level required you to use a specific weapon once, but once you beat it, you could replay it with any weapon you want. This time, however, you are limited to the weapons the game provides, which can be anywhere from one level that lets you pick between nine different weapons to none at all. However, the standard is about one to three and it usually gives you a recommended weapon. To enter a level, you have to pay a test fee. The most a single level ever charged was 3,000 tickets. Depending on the weapon you use, the levels pay out different amounts of tickets, which is a nice added twist. Also, each level only gives you a certain number of lives ranging from one to five. And if you lose all your lives, you have to pay the test fee again. Well, I could just go through and give a little overview. Let's just go through and look at a bunch of different stage types. The most common stage gimmick is just getting through a level just like in the default game. They even reuse levels from the default game. Sometimes there's a gimmick like doing it using only special weapons or bombs or limited ink, but no matter what, the principle is the same. They also sometimes add a time limit and it can get too close for comfort. Some levels have you breaking either all or a specific number of targets, sometimes while we'll rail grinding or racing the clock. These targets range from boxes to balloons that fly away to even the occasional enemies. There's a few levels that have you collecting several nodes or flipping switches to beat the level. One of the more difficult levels has you escorting an eight ball through the level. The first few times you come across this, it's pretty difficult, but over time it gets easier. Death to the infidel. <laughs> God damn it. Just do it myself. I'll do it my own damn self. Some levels have you dodging enemy attacks, and if you take a single hit, you lose. There are four levels that have you fighting harder versions of bosses from the default campaign, but they're never that much harder. Two levels have you smashing boxes to recreate shapes, a la 3D pit cross. Then there's a few levels that have you moving towers or rainmakers across maps from the multiplayer. Finally, there's levels that task you with protecting an orb from oncoming waves. In my experience, this is the most difficult levels. Now, there are some levels I did skip over, but those get into spoiled territory, which we will talk about later. The story this time around is that your player character, Agent 8, and Captain Cuttlefish, the guy from the first game, are trapped in a subway and you have to collect four thangs to make your way to the promised land. Along the way, you're also trying to learn the backstory as an Octoling and look for Agent 3, your player character from the first game. You also have two advice companions like the first game. This time around though, it's Pearl and Marina. Compared to Callie and Marie in the first game, Pearl and Marina are much more enjoyable and interesting characters. As you progress through the expansion, you unlock chat logs between Captain Cuttlefish, Pearl, and Marina. And honestly, these are my favorite character building moments in all of Splatoon. I highly recommend going through them because they're filled with so much love and care, and they just make Pearl and Marina some of the most likable characters. Oh, how do I make a chat window full screen? Oh, well, I am a female, so use Alt F4, because this is what females sound like. MC Princess has left the chat room. It commences. I can't. I can't believe that actually worked. Another important character you meet on the subway is Iso Padre. He admittedly doesn't do much, but he gives you gear for collecting mem cakes, which look like erasers. The last notable character is Sea Cucumber, who's the train conductor, and he gives you rewards here and there, nothing too interesting. There's also a plethora of background characters who don't really do anything, but they have some good designs. And without giving any spoilers away, we'll do that in the spoiler section. For beating the Octo expansion, you unlock the ability to play as an Octoling in 
multiplayer. This is a feature people have wanted since the first game, so I'm glad it's here. And while I would like to have more than two hairstyles each, Dr. Ling's have a plethora of new sounds and animations, and it's all really charming. Even though we've finally broken free of Octo Valley, the expansion still takes place underground. A lot of the level aesthetics do feel similar to ones in Octo Valley, including them reusing some of the story missions, but with new gimmicks. Other than that, the actual designs and backgrounds of the levels look nice and give an appealing vibe. One of my favorite features was that in certain levels, the backgrounds are filled with floating Nintendo consoles like GameCubes, N64s, Game Boys, etc. They also removed the sparkly ink from the default campaign, and I think it just looks better overall. When we first heard the music for the expansion in the trailers, well, honestly, I didn't really care for it. But in execution, I think the music works really well. Without spoiling anything, the farther I got into the game, the more I enjoyed the music. Even when tracks from the trailer came up, I found myself enjoying it. The music just does a good job at fitting the atmosphere the game tries to convey. I want to talk a little about endgame spoilers, not the actual final boss. You can go explore that for yourself. I will say though that the buildup and execution is much better than the final boss of the default game. No, what I want to talk about is the secret final boss. To unlock this, you have to beat the game and beat all 80 levels. The boss itself has you beat your player character from the previous game, which is a cool concept. That's why they do it during the standard DLC. Doing it again though is a pain in the ass and the difficulty is ramped up to 11. While there definitely are harder bosses in other games, in this game, this boss was bullshit difficult. What makes it difficult is the fact that the boss never stops from shooting, to throwing auto bombs, to using specials. The first phase was a pain, the second was easier, the third was nearly impossible, the fourth was stupid easy, and the last phase never stopped moving. Each phase uses a different special, and what I think would have been cool is if he either followed similar ink rules to you, and or he used the specials from the first game to give you a vibe that this battle took place two years ago in the past, like it says it does. After you suffer through it and beat the hero within, all you get is a stupid golden toothpick. It isn't worth it. A year ago, when I originally reviewed Splatoon 2, I said in about a year's time when all the updates had come out, I'd come back and review the game again based on everything that's been added. And while they recently did announce that they're going to continue to support the game for another six months, even now, I think we have a good handle on everything that was added. There were a bunch of new weapons that were added, whether they be wholly original or new subs or specials for existing weapons. There are, however, two new weapon classes, the Brella and the Squeezer. The Brella was technically in the game at launch, but it wasn't added into the multiplayer until shortly after. Cheap, no, no, cheap tactics make a good squid strong. No, no. <laughs> no. The sad part is that almost worked. There are three types of Brella, Normal, Tenta, and Undercover, with the main change being in how the shield is. Personally, the default Brella is my favorite weapon in the entire game. The Squeezer, on the other hand, isn't the best or worst weapon. Now, the game classifies it as a shooter, but much like the Blaster, I chalk it up to its own category. It fires off a single shot before going into a short-range automatic mode. There are two variants, but no other types. There are a plethora of new stages, most of which are brand new, but there are a few returning from previous games. With one exception, I don't hate any of the new stages. They've also added two stages to Salmon Run and some gimmicks like random weapons and weapons exclusive to the mode. There's also pieces of gear that are exclusively earned in Salmon Run each month. Speaking of monthly, there's been a Splatfest every month. There's still a nice monthly change of pace, and even when I wasn't playing Splatoon, I was still always coming back for the Splatfest. The main Splatfest gimmick this time around is a Splatfest exclusive stage, Shifty Stations. Shifty Stations may be the best stage in the game because it takes advantage of mechanics we see in the single player, like invisible walls, cannons, and shifting walls. While not every Shifty Stations is gold, there's almost always the highlight of the Splatfest. Last and arguably the biggest change is a new ranked mode, Clam Blitz. Clam Blitz is a mode where you travel the stage collecting clams. Once you get 10 clams, you form a football you can throw into the enemy's goal. First to get 100, give or take, clams in the enemy goal wins. From what 
that I can tell, this mode seems to be divisive for people, but personally I like it. It's not my favorite or anything, that still belongs to tower control. They also added tons of new gear and some amiibo stuff. Finally, they added a new ranked mode, that being rank X. Now my highest rank is X, so I've never played X, but from what I understand, it seems to work like seasons you see in other games like Rainbow Six Siege or Fortnite. I'll admit it, I do not play Splatoon 2 as much as others. I come back at least once a month, usually for the Splatfest, which I do stream. All the new weapons, stages, and modes have kept me coming back to the game once in a while. New Salmon Run gear is always enticing, even if I never use it. I also started my podcast-esque show in chat in Splatoon. At the end of the day, if you haven't picked up Splatoon a year after launch, I do still highly recommend it. And with another six months of content, the game does a good job at enticing you to return. When it comes to the Octo expansion, if you bought the game at launch, I see no reason not to buy it. For some people, 20 bucks may seem like a lot for DLC, but there's more than enough bang for your buck here. This isn't your standard Activision DLC. There is actual content in depth here. If you're buying the game for the first time, I do still recommend picking up the expansion, but if you're strapped for cash, there's more than enough content in the default game where you can wait a little. Overall, I'm going to give the Octo expansion a great, as per Nintendo continuing the tradition of having some of the best DLC in the industry, and for Splatoon 2 in its entirety, I'm going to give it an amazing, taking everything into account from the content at launch, to the past year of updates, to the entirety of the expansion, if you own a Switch, it is a must-own game. 